Israel's prime minister saying that giving up control of the Philadelphia corridor could allow the Hamas terror group to smuggle the remaining hostages out of Gaza, possibly over to Iran, Yemen, or another country. Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu addressing the state of Israel days after the bodies of six hostages were recovered from a tunnel underneath Rafah. All six, including Israeli-American Hirsch Goldberg Poland, were executed a day or two prior to being located by Israeli troops. Now, Hamas did hint that it murdered the hostages because Israeli troops were getting close to rescuing them. And the terror group did indicate they would do it again if the Israeli military got close to other hostages. Do want to talk about all of this, so let's bring in Jonathan Shanzer, Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us today. My pleasure. All right, so first off, I do want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the comments that were made by Prime Minister Netanyahu just yesterday as he did address the state of Israel. What kind of stood out to you about his comments and the address overall? Well, I think there was a message of defiance in there. Uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of Israelis coming out into the streets protesting this government. Um, they're charging that this government has not done enough to save the hostages, to protect those that were taken by Hamas on October 7th. And obviously we've seen tragedy after tragedy with occasional good news, Israelis you know, recovering some of their hostages alive. Uh, but we've seen, I think, a lot more bad news uh, over these months. And I think the Israeli public's been trying to hold Benjamin Netanyahu to account. Now, I would say here that on the one hand, this is a man who served a very long time, longest serving prime minister um, in Israel's history. He presided over the October 7th uh, intelligence collapse, and he's been somewhat paralyzed by uh, the, the events on the ground. I don't think he has a particularly effective strategy against all the different fronts that he's facing. On the other hand, I think that some of what they're asking for is unfair, the, host the, uh, the, the protesters. What they want right now is for Netanyahu to agree to leave uh, what you mentioned, the Philadelphia corridor. This is an area um, that runs astride the border of the Sinai Peninsula on, in Egypt and Gaza. And beneath there, uh, we believe, are dozens, if not even more than 100 different tunnels. It's unclear to us at this point how many Israel has destroyed or blocked. But these are the supply lines for, uh, for Hamas. Egypt, for reasons unclear, and we're not exactly sure of all the specifics yet, they have been uh, allowing for this to take place. If Israel does not stay there, and makes a deal with Hamas to get the hostages back, what they're doing is they're opening up the supply lines for Hamas so that they can fight future wars. And this is something that is unacceptable to Israel's prime minister. I think I understand why. You know, Israel has two uh, uh, war aims, and I think to some extent they conflict with one another. On the one hand, they're calling for the return of all the hostages. There are about 100 right now uh, that are still in Hamas uh, custody and uh, be obviously being held against their will. We don't know how many, by the way, are still alive. It could be 40, it could be 50, it could be 30. I mean, we just don't know. Uh, but uh, that that's one war aim, and that's to get all of those back. The other is to defeat Hamas. And if they strike a deal where they yield the Philadelphia quarter back to Hamas control, they're probably not going to be able to retake it again. And then Hamas has its lifeline open again. And I think this is the crux of the debate right now. I don't think there are easy answers. And I think there are a lot of people who are painting this as black and white. I think it's not fair. Um, there are some very difficult decisions for the Israeli government in the days ahead. I want to also talk about comments that were made by President Biden versus what we've heard from Secretary of State Antony Blinken really just weeks ago here. So Biden was asked yesterday by a reporter if he felt that Netanyahu was doing enough to get a ceasefire hostage release deal agreed upon there with Hamas. And he simply said no.
Then you have just a few weeks ago when Secretary of State Antony Blinken mentioned that Israel has actually accepted the deal that was on the table, and it's really on Hamas to accept it as well. So you almost have kind of conflicting statements there. What do you make of all of that? I got to say, I think the hypocrisy from this White House is just striking. I mean, first of all, they keep coming back. The White House keeps coming back with deals and they're, they're take it or leave it deals. And every time Israel takes it and every time Hamas leaves it. Um, and so the Israelis have just had the rug pulled out from under them multiple times. Uh, they're trying to fight a war at the same time. You've got the United States that is at, at times uh, holding back on weapons deliveries, in many cases, delivering blistering criticism that I think is unwarranted. The Israelis have been incredibly careful and professional as they have fought in an urban warfare environment against a brutal terrorist organization. And I don't think there's really any acknowledgement of what's been going on. They have been flexible in terms of diplomacy, and they have done what has been asked of them time and time again from the United States. And what we see on the other side, though, is a U.S. that is unwilling to put pressure on those who are actually responsible for the crisis in which we find ourselves right now. In other words, it is Hamas that carried out the attacks of 10-7. They're the ones who uh, murdered 1,200 people. They're the ones who kidnapped more than 200. Then you have Hezbollah that's been firing rockets at Israel since October 8th. And the Israelis have shown remarkable restraint even as they've wanted to head north and to vanquish this terrorist organization, it's well within their rights to do so. The U.S. has asked that Israel restrain itself. All the while, the U.S. has not put pressure on Iran. It's not put pressure on the other patrons of Hamas, namely Qatar and Turkey. They've not put pressure on the Egyptians who've allowed these tunnels to operate. And they've not done enough, I think, to allow for um, the kind of international pressure, the broad international pressure that we need to see. I believe that Hamas, if it felt like the world was against them, if it felt like Iran, their primary patron, was going to pay a significant price, I think we would see a very different outcome. I actually lay a lot of the blame at the feet of the United States. It's not enough. If you want to end the war, it's not enough just to provide the weapons for Israel to win. And they had not done that consistently. They need to deliver clear messages, and they're not doing it. And I think part of that has to do with domestic considerations here in the United States. There is a significant number within the Democratic Party that don't uh, support the war. They don't want Israel to be fighting, but that's really not their choice. This is not a war that Israel wanted. It's not a war that Israel asked for. And Israel does have the right and, quite frankly, the need to get back its hostages, its citizens. And uh, I, I just don't really understand the U.S. policy right now and the idea of blaming uh, Israel when it did not want this in the first place strikes me as just bizarre. Qatar and Egypt have essentially been considered mediators. We've had talks that have been in Doha as well as Cairo, but they're not exactly neutral. So why are they being considered uh, mediators and why are they really involved in the process when it appears just based on the outside that they are almost siding with Hamas over Israel? Yeah, these guys are, are not neutral um, uh, brokers here. They are not. I mean, I think we can be quite clear about this. The Qataris uh, have been uh, providing a headquarters to Hamas for more than a decade now. Um, they are the piggy bank. They're the ATM for Hamas over the years. In recent years, they've actually been providing tens of millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars per month, uh, and and bringing that money into Gaza and keeping the Hamas government alive. Now, some people have charged Israel. They said, "Well, you know, Israel was party to this. Israel agreed to this." because the United States and the Qataris said that this was the way to keep calm in the Gaza Strip. This doesn't look like calm right now. In other words, this looks like the Israelis agreed to this, and then they've paid a horrific price for agreeing to the demands of Qatar and the United States. But the Qataris, by the way, we should all know, deeply corrupt nation. This is an autocracy that has been supporting the likes of Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, Hamas, the Muslim Brotherhood, 
I mean, I, I, I really can't point to a terror group that doesn't have some kind of representation in Doha. They are, in my view, a state sponsor of terror. They should not be identified as a major non-NATO ally. Then you've got Egypt, and Egypt is even more complicated because the Egyptians are actually on the dole of the United States. We provide them more than a billion dollars a year. American taxpayers give Egypt money for keeping calm in the region, preserving the U.S.-led world order. Now, Egypt has gone through some really difficult economic time, uh, times lately. They need this money very desperately, and we have kept that money going, and yet somehow we have overlooked here in the United States, I think the Israelis missed this too, that they were operating these tunnels along the Philadelphia corridor, tunnels sneaking into the town of Rafa, where the six hostages were found, uh, to the two live hostages that were recovered uh, just a few days ago, also found in Rafa. This is an area where the Egyptians have been saying, don't operate there. They've been warning the Israelis. They have been screaming at the top of their lungs, telling the Israelis that they cannot be there what they're trying to do, from my assessment, is they're trying to paper over, they're trying to cover up the fact that they have been operating these supply lines for Hamas probably since 2018, maybe even earlier than that. And that is a major violation of the Camp David Accords, the peace agreement brokered by Jimmy Carter between Israel and Egypt in the 1970s. They are not keeping up their end of the bargain and we need to hold them to account. We need to see congressional hearings. We need to see intelligence estimates of what exactly is going on right now in Egypt. The United States has been shamefully quiet about this. I think the Israelis have been trying to keep a lid on it because they want to keep their relationship with the Egyptians, but this is not working. And neither uh, Egypt nor Qatar should be involved in these ceasefire talks. As you noted, they are not honest brokers. These are deeply corrupt countries that appear to be complicit in the terror activity of Hamas recently, but perhaps even over years. Hamas, and I talked about this just moments ago, but they seem to indicate that the reason they executed these six hostages is because Israeli troops got too close to them. And it sounds as though they were given, from what they've said, a new directive, so to speak, that if uh, Israeli troops are able to get close to any other hostages, they're expected to do the same. So is that likely to deter Israeli troops from searching for those hostages? I think it's really hard to ask the Israelis not to be looking for those hostages. Um, they have been frantically looking for the hostages for the last 11 months. Um, and, and all the while, they've been dismantling Hamas infrastructure. There's a massive network of tunnels below ground that need to be neutralized, something like a thousand or more kilometers worth of tunnels that Hamas has built, by the way, diverting international aid, diverting cement, diverting building materials that could have been used to benefit the Gazan people. And the Israelis are, are trying to get a handle on the tunnel networks. They're trying to find their hostages. They're trying to do it in a way that does not demand a major concession from the Israelis as it relates to the Philadelphia corridor primarily. The Israelis do not want to give up control over this so long as the Egyptians have not agreed to secure these uh, supply lines, to shut them down. And so it's really hard for me to imagine the Israelis stopping their search, even as they have learned of a directive handed down, likely by Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas, uh, to kill the hostages when Israeli soldiers come close. The question really I have is, how many are still left? How many are actually uh, in direct proximity to Hamas fighters or Hamas leaders? We've heard that Sinwar, by the way, has uh, surrounded himself with 10 or maybe 20 hostages, live hostages, that he believes that they are his insurance policy that the Israelis won't strike him. The Israelis, according to estimates we've heard, have actually had their sights on him two or maybe even three times, and they have declined to fire upon him because of the fact that there were live hostages that he was using as human shields. This is a war crime, by the way. And so is the summary execution of the hostages that we saw the other day. So is hostage taking. So we're seeing multiple war crimes here, and the Israelis are just doing everything they can to try to recover them with a very brutal enemy holding them on the other side. 
And what you're looking at there on the left side of your screen is a live look over in the West Bank right now, where we know the operation does continue there by Israel, the one that started just last week. They say at this point they have taken out dozens of terrorists as a result. Now, so many people have referred to the war in Gaza as the Israel-Hamas war, saying that it's Israel versus Hamas. And my last question for you, it really appears that it's more Israel versus Iran. Absolutely. Look, uh, Iran has been waging at least a seven-front war against Israel since October 7th. And I don't think that's fully understood here in the United States or really anywhere else around the world. Look, it started with Hamas, which is an Iran-backed proxy. They carry out an attack on October 7th. They kill 1,200 people. They take 250-some hostages. And then the following day, we see another Iranian proxy, Hezbollah, out of Lebanon, start firing missiles and rockets at Israel, unprovoked, in response to nothing, literally nothing. And what has been happening ever since is we've seen 6,700 plus rockets, missiles, and drones fired out of Lebanon into Israel, uh, forcing the evacuation of about 150,000 Israelis from the northern communities of the country. So there's front number two. On top of that, as we all know, we've watched the Houthis in Yemen firing drones and ballistic missiles at Israel intermittently, by the way, also terrorizing the Red Sea and halting maritime trade, which has impacted American interests as well. Though these are front number three. Then you've got different Shiite militias that have been firing on Israel, and by the way, also attacking American troops and bases. Those militias are based out of Iraq and Syria. They are also Iranian proxies, just as the Houthis, just as Hezbollah, just as Hamas is. So those are uh, the major proxy fronts. And then we see on top of that, Iran itself has been waging war against Israel. On the night of April 13th, they fired something like 400 plus missiles and drones and rockets into Israel. So that brings us to seven fronts. That doesn't even include what Iran is doing to spur chaos and unrest on campus. You could call that front number eight. You could look at the media war, the disinformation war that we know that Iran has been waging in cyberspace. You could call that you know, front number nine. Um, I mean, look, we could keep adding on here the different ways that Iran has been waging this war, and yet somehow the regime in Tehran has not been held to account. And look, the Israelis obviously need to think very hard about what they want to do to respond to this aggression. But by the way, so does the United States. If we really want this thing to come to an end, we are going to have to think long and hard about who we hold to account. I don't think it's the Israelis. I don't think that it is uh, really anyone's fault other than Iran and its proxy networks. And so until we start to say that out loud and until we start to take action to mitigate their ability to wage this war, we're going to see more of the same. All right, Jonathan Shanzer, as always, thank you so much for joining us here and breaking down a lot of different topics. There are so many different developments happening pretty much on an hourly basis. I say it all the time. So before I let you go, is there anything else that you want to add overall about the situation in the Middle East? Well, look, I mean, I think maybe one thing that we should just note is keep an eye on the West Bank. Um, that's actually another front, uh, you know, in addition to all the others that I just mentioned. Um, that is growing um, and it's becoming increasingly a problem. We're watching the smuggling of weapons and, uh, and cash and uh, drugs into Jordan by way of Syria. Again, Iran proxy is doing this. The drugs stay in Jordan with the intent to destabilize the country. The cash and the weapons are moved into the West Bank and we're seeing more and more violent activity. Uh, generally directed by groups like Hamas and Islamic Jihad. Once again, Iranian proxies doing the dirty work here as Iran fights Israel to the last Arab. This is what is happening all around the region. And they are trying to encircle the Israelis. They're trying to destabilize all of America's allies. This is not something that we can allow to happen. I'm concerned right now that there's not enough initiative being taken in this White House because we are caught up in an election cycle here. The focus is domestic. I think Iran knows this. I think they like what they see, and I think they're going to keep doing it until we change our policy. And I don't see that happening right now, and that is cause for real concern. All right, Jonathan Shanzer, thank you again for being here with us today. We appreciate it.
Thank you.